it's very nice to have so many here. This is the session for the ESAC. ESAC stands for External Science Advisory Group. Uh, you are helping us improve the center. For this year, we have a change in the ESAC. We have seven members that comprise the ESAC. Three of them are old. That means they carry over from the previous, and four of them are new. And it's my great pleasure to have all of you seven people from the ESAC here now, and we will listen to your talks. We're very interesting. We have to be strict with time. So you have eight minutes each, because all of you, all the seven of you attended and came. We hadn't really, you know. <laughs> so, so it's eight minutes. I will stand up after six minutes. And it would be great if we could have time for at least one question to each of you. Sure. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back to Stockholm University and to give this talk. When I thought about this eight minutes, I thought maybe it's not a good idea to talk about a specific project. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to tell you what I have been doing over the last few years and, uh, and also what I'm going to do maybe over the next five years because I think I have a plan. Uh, so the topic is, is of the third poll. And uh, before I'm going to do that topic, I want to show you two slides. Some of you have seen that, two slides, but I think it's still nice to see after Nina's your slides about the history of our polling center. And one slide is about the historical development in global change science internationally. And that is a slide showing that uh, the, both the ideas, thinking, and also organization at the international level. And as you probably know that the World Climate Research Program was the first one, and after that we have the IPCC. IGP, IGPP was based in Stockholm, it's very, played a very important role. And we have IHDP, yesterday we heard something from political science, very interesting. And, uh, and what is important is that the Earth system science was invented, if you want, 2001, and uh, but was not quite successful. That is why uh, in 2009 we, we did something at the ICSU International Council for Science, uh, visioning exercises, looking at the future strategies and big questions. And we come up with a concept <laughs> for the sustainability because, Nina, you showed also the 17 uh, sustainability development goals, which is quite important, actually. Not every researcher is uh, aware of that, but I think it's, it's going to have a long-term impact on what we are doing. And what we came up with is this kind of diagram, very short. After we came up with five grand challenges, and I want to show you this because from what I have heard, actually many of the things has been happening here in your center also. I think in the group I'm sitting, we should have also discussion, reflecting on what we are doing. And uh, so now I'm going to my topic, and uh, which is a third pole. As you know, why is it called a third pole? Because this is a Tibetan plateau basically has a lot of ice after the two poles actually. And it has implications for many rivers in the region. And uh, this year, uh, last year, we have a uh, uh, Swedish uh, uh, Vega medal, which is a medal, which is a quite a famous one. And uh, the Swedish uh, polar scientists, all of them actually got that medal in the past. And last year was given to a Chinese scientist. Uh, he organized something called the TPE. This is something I'm going to talk about a little bit. It's called the Third Pole Environment. It's an international program. And within that program, I personally know spent a lot of uh, some years to do an IPCC-like process to assess the environmental change and climate change in this region. And uh, so we focus on the past and also looking into the future with, uh, with uh, projections. And what we came up with is, of course, the reconstruction with trees. I saw you also have a lot of treeing activities here in the past, like temperature here. And also we study very carefully the temperature and the precipitation over this instrumental period of time. And what we have found is that actually there is a warming, that is my title of my talk today, amplified warming, not in the polar regions, not in the Arctic region actually. So we found that warming rate of this region is two times to three times more than the global average. And you might be wondering, why is that? Well, we come up with uh, explanation. There are several theoretical ones. But basically, elevation plays a role. The higher you get, the higher warming rate you have. And of course, it's due to the feedback system. 
And if you look at the whole region, it's basically controlled by two systems. One is monsoon, and the, another one is the western east. And uh, if you look at the impact of this change, is the glaciers and uh, uh, is, is uh, re reducing, you can imagine. Also, we have found that the lakes areas are increasing quite dramatically. And the rivers, of course, you probably have uh, heard the IPCC made mistake that uh, the rivers in, in this region will, or the glaciers will be terminated by 2030. <laughs> that was a mistake. And, but of course, the glaciers are melting. It increased the runoff water resources for a while. But then, of course, after 2050 or 60, around that time, we found, of course, you will be going to have some problem. And that is what we have been doing so far. And uh, a few years ago, we started to think about this. And we made a decision to expand the area from the third pole to something called the pan third pole. Why is that? It's partly because of this study we did. We look at the, the water cycle. This is the Tibetan plateau and third pole. And we try to trace back the soil or the water vapor, the precipitation for precipitation. And we found that actually this large area. Of course, this is, uh, yesterday you heard the Somani jet, the monsoon transport, and this is the westerly transport of the moisture to this region. So we felt the need to expand the area. And uh, so we are going to take earth system science approach and uh, at the regional level, we're going to focus on three things, water ecosystem and human influences. Personally, I'm really interested in the water cycle. I know a lot of activities are here. And uh, yesterday we heard already some plans. I really hope we can collaborate also on that uh, for the future. And that is what I want to say. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yes. So it's interesting that you get this increased warming also with the speed of plateau. But what's the main mechanism? Yeah. It looks like the, the albedo effect is the biggest, and then the lapse rate, and uh, there are six more has been identified. And, uh, is this a robust result of several data sets and so on? Reanalysis, for instance, can you see? Real analysis is not obvious. It's uh, uh, very weak. And uh, the observation is scarce in this region. That is the biggest problem. It's only actually just the diagram I showed you, there's not so many stations, there's two or three in each of the elevation beams. So what we are going to do in this program, I'm talking about the PAN TPE. Uh, we actually, we just got the uh, big funding from China, two buildings with each kronos. And uh, so, we are going <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are going to set up a lot of stations there. Uh, it, it has been reporting nature and science, nature, I think, yeah. a lot about this new initiative. And uh, I think the observation is a key thing. The second thing we are going to do is the high resolution reanalysis for this region. We are planning a three kilometer based on your center's uh, high resolution data. Uh, a few months ago, we invite people from your center. We talked to you before that we are going to do this. Uh, uh, downscaling and also reanalysis by enlarging. And we hope that regional reanalysis will help to answer some of the questions because the data, it, the topography is really dramatic. And uh, I have a diagram here just to quickly. That is, we did another study looking at the scale of the variability in this region. So this is for precipitation. You can see the dominant scale is just a few kilometers in the region. And uh, this is why we, we, we did, uh, we did uh, some tests recently with two kilometers. Actually, we, we found that we, we have to, to come down to that scale to really do the model, the climate, the uh, variabilities in the region. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be many more questions, but we need to move on. And the next speaker is Ray Chuang Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I have an animation yeah. back there too. Um, okay. Yeah. And so you just, can just click the okay. start. Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
Oh, actually, let's see. Where no. Oh, okay. I've got that. Got it. okay. That's up there. Yes. Okay. So uh, th this this may seem like going quite far afield from the Boleyn Center, but the fact is, uh, it, so there's something on the recycling bin out there. So there's there, are, there is no Planet B. Actually, we've got there is no Planet B that's just like Earth, not yet. But uh, and if if there is one, we probably can't get there. Uh, but we do have about uh, 3,000 new planets that we know about around stars other than our own. Uh, and, uh, and this gives us a, gr a great field for exploring new kinds of, new kinds of climates. And so on this talk, I, I um, want to tell you a little bit about, uh, about uh, a, a particular class of, of planets, tide-locked exoplanets, that give, that in which some of the old ideas that will be very familiar from people who have studied trop GFD, uh, of tropical meteorology, tropical uh, climate dynamics, um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll see that these ideas have gotten new life in a new form when thinking about some of these oddball, some of these uh, oddball, but in fact quite common, quite common planets. How do I actually? How do I switch to? Do... I knew this was going to happen if I use some other computer. Yeah. Try now. Okay. Is, is okay. And uh, a lot of this work was with my collaborator, uh, Peng Ding, who recently graduated uh, from the University of Chicago, and Mark Hammond, who's one of my uh, new, uh, new graduate students at, uh, uh, at Oxford. Let me skip that. But just uh, the basic idea uh, is that uh, of tide locking is that um, if a planet, uh, if, if a body is, in a, is close into another, another body that it's, it's orbiting, there are tidal stresses on it that tend to spin it down uh, until the tidal stresses vanish. And this is why the moon always presents the same face to, to the Earth. Uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of exoplanets, in fact, are so close to their star that they, they're tide locked to the star. So there's a, a, a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And the only reason the night side gets heated up at all is through uh, is through energy trans transmitted through the atmosphere, carried by the atmosphere to the night side, which keeps your whole atmosphere from collapsing onto the night side. And this is what makes uh, allows tide lock planets to be habitable. In fact, uh, I'd say I'm going to skip the equation, but these are just some of our, uh, our uh, uh, some of our, our uh, uh, named planets or numbered planets. Uh, 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 that are that are in in uh, orbits where they could be tide locked. So this one, for example, orbits its star with a period of 1.6 Earth days. These are these are red dwarf stars. These are sun-like G stars. But um, the time this this just gives you an idea of how quickly it would, it would uh, how quickly tide locking would occur for these. These are in millions of years, and so this planet only would take. We started it out with Earth's rotation. It would only take uh, it would only take 13 years. Uh, uh, thir 13 years for it to become tide locked. This one would take 1.4 million years to be tide locked, and uh, this one, which I just published a paper on, only, would only take uh, uh, would only take a half a year to become tide locked. The tidal stresses are so are so strong, and the basic idea uh, of of the uh, of tide locked atmospheric dynamics uh, really comes from something called the weak temperature gradient approximation, which was developed for Earth's tropics. So these these planets are tide locked, but they have a they do have a Coriolis force because they rotate you know, their their day is equal to their year, so there's still rotation rate. But the orbital periods tend to be something between two two Earth days and uh, and uh, and uh, say 30 or 60 Earth days. So the core and given that these planets that I'm talking about are actually maybe twice the Earth radius, they effectively act like slowly rotating planets. And so the in the the uh, Tropics on the Earth is a slowly rotating planet, in essence, because the Coriolis effect is quite weak. So we have global weak temperature gradient approx uh, uh, global weak temperature gradient behavior um, with all of its tropical wave dynamics that applies on a global scale rather than just in the tropical part of these of these planets. And so um, and so we can expl exploit this to look at questions like like uh, uh, how hot is the day side? This is right where it's permanent high noon all the time. How hot is the day side versus the night side? This is from one of my early simulations where I have, had a simple ocean there where you get on the day side a kind of circular swimming pool of open water uh, and, and, then, uh, and then a frozen over night side. Uh, and um, uh, you see, uh, and you see uh, uh, some other phenomena 
uh, in this kind of simulation, this kind of regime that are quite similar to what's familiar from the Earth's uh, from the Earth's polar regions. In that, uh, uh, in the, the day side, this is the, this is uh, longitude going from the day side to the night side. There, this is the substellar point where the sun is directly overhead all the time. Uh, this is the temperature uh, versus height. You get uh, you get you get convection, which is establishes establishes a dry adiabat. Uh, on the day side, it's like the mother of all West Pacific warm pools. But then on the night side, you get an inversion, a permanent inversion, just like you get in the just like you get in the winter time in the Arctic, uh, and you get heating from the subsidence of the air uh, that is coming down. Uh, but also uh, an inversion, which allows you to have ice on the night side, even though the temperature gradient in the free troposphere, this is 500 millibars or so, is, is quite weak. And I have time probably to show you just one or two aspects of the wave dynamics. You can understand these sort of things quantitatively uh, in terms of uh, a lot of things quantitatively in terms of the model that Matsuno and Gill uh, came up with uh, for understanding, uh, under, understanding the uh, uh, circulation in the, in the Pacific. Uh, so now this is latitude, longitude. This is on the equatorial beta plane, where you get Kelvin waves, which establish, which which uh, which are which uh, uh, are symmetric about the equator without a node, uh, and and generate easterlies there, and then you generate uh, westerlies on the other side, and these these two Rossby lobes uh, that give you a, char a characteristic uh, uh, pressure and temperature pattern, and you see things that are very similar to that in, in the setup. You know, in this. Okay, in, in the setup of the uh, in the setup uh, when you spin up a uh, uh, when you spin up a uh, tide lock planet from rest. So this is the geopotential. This one is the uh, um, let's see, is this that one was the uh, the geopotential height. Uh, and so I, I'll just play it one more time. Uh, the uh, the red spot is right on is where it's permanent noon. That's right in the sub. Right in the substellar point, and there you see your Kelvin waves coming that way. You see the beginning of the, you see a Rossby wave going that way, and this is the beginning of the of the Rossby lobes uh, spreading spreading upstream. And I'll just show you what the temperature pattern that goes along with that is. And this is this is for a planet called Trappist One B, which is has Earth-like temperature Earth-like temperature range. Um, so, so there are a lot of interesting all the uh, all the stuff you learned in your GFD classes uh, uh, now is suddenly applicable to a whole range of different climates, including some climates where the ocean is not a water ocean but a permanent magma ocean. But the same physics applies at 3,000 Kelvin as applies in the West Pacific warm pool, and so uh, so there's a whole new sandbox to play around in. Thank you very much, Ray. You said you had slides for an hour. I believe that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have time for one quick question or comment. Yes. Uh, so, so the, the reason why it's five blocks, I didn't fully get it, but, but it's because of the moving mass of the planet. Yeah. So it's not that you have to. Well, actually, it's the solid tide. Actually, it doesn't. You, you don't need. You don't need an ocean. An ocean actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just because uh, because the uh, the the planet is elastic and dissipative. So, so it, it gets it gets squeeze it gets pulled out into an egg shape in the tidal in the tidal gradient and the gravitational gradient. But if it's rotating, you're continuously deforming the system. Do we know with these planets how how elastic? So you're saying no, so 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 no. They we that's that's and actually, in fact, uh, the uh, the degree to which they are actually tide locked is uh, will be used. To estimate the rheological properties in the interior of these of these planets, but but in terms of uh, the ones the systems that are older, uh, for these systems the tide locking time is so short, you, know, you could change the uh, the dissipation by an order of magnitude, and it, it won't change the fact that they'll be tide locked. Sorry, oh. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, I was hoping for the Wait. question. Could you could you give us the other hour of the talk? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much yeah. again. We move on to the next speaker. So Andreas Lindroth will take us down to Earth, I guess, with the forest. Oh, yes. yes. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I am one of the old guys uh, in, in several respects. Uh, and uh, I will talk about something that uh, interests me a lot, and that uh, the role of 
forest in, in the climate system. Uh, and we have very little time, so I will speed it up. Uh, I guess uh, you have seen this picture many times, and uh, that came out just a couple of days ago, the 2016 carbon budget from the Global Carbon Pro Project. They make uh, uh, tremendous work uh, in, in describing uh, and following what's happening. Uh, and uh, as you know, the sinks we have on the terrestrial part of the Earth and on the sea are very important to keep keep the, 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 the increase uh, in, in the atmosphere as low as possible. So I will talk about uh, uh, the terrestrial part. And one question is, of course, uh, this sink, where is it? Uh, and there are some independent estimates of, uh, uh, of this sink. And, and one study is in, in the forest. Uh, it's an, uh, uh, based on inventory, inventory measurements. It was a couple of years ago this came out, 2011. Uh, and they estimated that it was about 9 gigatons of CO2 every year uh, uh, absorbed by the forest. And as you, if you remember the previous slide, the terrestrial part was estimated to 11 uh, gigatons. So most of the sink is probably in, in the forest as far as we can, can understand. So uh, yesterday there was some talk about uh, changes in seasonality. Uh, uh, and, and one thing that we, we looked, I'm very much a flux person myself. I have been working with Edicovarian's uh, flux measurement uh, in uh, mostly forest, uh, boreal forest, and also in, in Arctic areas. Uh, and we made an analysis of uh, how the change in uh, snow melt was affecting uh, the carbon uptake. And we found out that it was actually uh, the springtime changes was increasing uh, the carbon uptake. But actually, uh, 10 years ago, we also made another study where we looked at what's happening in the autumn because we get, we get also a, a change in the autumn with the, with the warming. Uh, both warming and the, the time change will also affect the, the carbon. And that's a negative because there we get more emissions because the respiration is dominating in the autumn and it's a quite exponential relationship to temperature. So we actually don't know what these two things do together if they compensate each other. But I'm afraid that uh, the, the autumn effect is probably more important because of this exponential dependency on, on temperature. But it's also related to moisture, so we don't really know in the long term what will happen. But we have some tools where we can follow this and study this in the FluxNet uh, 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 data. So that, that was just one thing that we have been doing. Uh, we also made uh, a larger analysis that was also a couple of years ago, 2009, uh, where we used the FluxNet uh, data set to uh, study how the different uh, uh, biomes were performing in, in, in respect to fluxes. And I will just show you a few slides on that. It's not so easy. This, this shows actually the uh, net ecosystem productivity. That means that positive values are things that are up, more uptake than, than, than losses, which are down here. Uh, and as you can see, there is a very large scatter here. And, and, there are, and these are uh, site average values, so it's not just single years. Uh, and there are many forests that are actually sources over long periods of time. And you also can see the very large variability. Uh, you see also the, the difference between biomes, so the boreal, the green one, they are generally lower. Uh, and that's mainly because of temperature, lower productivity, and, and also lower respiration rate. But <clears throat> this is something to keep in mind when you use this data that, uh, that there are very big uh, variability from site to site. And it's not so easy all, all, always to understand why this uh, variability comes from. But there is a relatively strong correlation between the net primary productivity, which is actually related mostly to tree growth uh, <coughs> and the net ecosystem productivity. Even if you can have situations where you have uh, <coughs> high MPP net productivity, but you have still uh, losing carbon from the system, which is something that uh, happens at some of the sites. 
Uh, and if we look at one more slide, we can see that plot against leaf area index that when we have leaf areas about, above about two, then there is no big correlation between leaf area index and, and carbon uptake anymore. So that's things, it's a quite useful data set and you can download the, the data set from, from the web. Uh, it's a lot of data in it. Another thing that I'm interested in is uh, management, forest management, and how that is affecting the carbon uptake. Uh, and as you know, we have this called even age silviculture in our forest, and 90% of the forest is managed this way, that we have mature, okay, mature sites <coughs> which are clear cut, and then we plant, and we get a new forest after about 100, 120 years, it's time again to harvest. Uh, and the, the cycle looks like this. We have a lot of losses in the beginning after the clear cut. We have recovery and then we gain uh, no negative values is uptake. So it's always confusing. So this is <clears throat> one question that I have been looking at is can we somehow uh, eliminate these losses that we have in the beginning? Uh, and one alternative is to have selective cutting, not doing the clear cutting. And how is this affecting? Uh, the carbon uptake. We made a, a sort of selective cutting experiment in one of our forests in Norunda, where we harvested 25% of the trees, just the thinning, normal thinning, and looked at the results. Uh, and uh, if you look, this is before the thinning, these are annual values, daytime, <coughs> long-term trend. Uh, the rings here, that before the NEE, net ecosystem exchange, before the thinning, this is only during growing season, and this is after the thinning. So we lose a lot of uptake capacity during uh, after the thinning. But it's also recovery, like this blue line is showing. This is just the modeling of the drivers, showing that there is no change in drivers. So it's an effect of the, of the thinning. Uh, for uh, nighttime or respiration, we see also that it doesn't happen much after the thinning, but we actually have a reduction of respiration after the thinning. And I think I have one final slide where we also estimated <coughs> uh, on the annual basis. And the surprising thing was that we saw a clear decrease of the uptake during the growing season, but on an annual basis, we don't see any effect. And that's because during the <coughs> dormant season, respiration is dominating and that becomes smaller. So that compensates for the losses of, of, of uh, uh, during the growing season. So that was actually my final slide. It's perfect. It's 757. <laughs> yes, one question over there. You were first. Um, I'm a surprise you talk about uh, forests as carbon sinks. Are they stocks? No, no. I mean, the carbon go? Long term. Long term, I mean, so that. Yeah, but uh, forests are generally, also old forests are, well, we don't really know. There are not many studies on old, really old forests, but there are some studies and they show, some of them show that they are continue to be a large sink also when they are old. We have made one study in the northern Sweden and we saw that it's a small sink also after, it has never been managed. So it's a completely natural forest. It continue to build up carbon in the soil. So, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, what we are looking at is the whole system, including the soil and the trees, not only the trees. Thank you, Anders, very much. Okay. We continue with Camille Parmesan talking about... Uh, I changed the title. You changed anyway. the title, okay. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> So yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Because of the uh, nature of the Boland Center, I decided I would talk about uh, some interdisciplinary work that I've been involved in, and also because several of the ecologists here have heard me way too many times, and so I wanted something new. Uh, so in, in being in the IPCC for about, what, almost 20 years now, uh, it actually has spurred quite a bit of my own research. And what I want to talk about is, is how that came about. Uh, and here's one example, and, and this, in IPCC, the idea of detection and attribution is sort of fundamental. This has run through the process since it began. And what they mean by attribution 
or what the uh, climate modelers mean by attribution is the extent to which a change, so the extent to which, say, an overall global warming, can be uh, quantitatively broken down into, into the different drivers, and in particularly how much of the observed change is due to anthropogenic forces, like greenhouse gases, versus how much is due to natural climate variability. And they've done this very, very well. You can see uh, to the bars to the right are warming, bars to the left are cooling. If I can learn how to, there we go. <laughs> Bars to the left are cooling. And so they've quantified the effect of all these different drivers on the overall warming of the globe. And you can see a very strong increase in the anthropogenic forcing, greenhouse gases, and in particular that that's very large in comparison to natural solar variability. And so in this DNA guidance um, group, what the climate modelers wanted us to do is one of the first uh, interactions between the climate modelers and the biologist, they said, OK, we've got our climate models. Uh, and so you give us, or where we work with you, with your ecological models, and we're going to put these together. And we'll be able to then quantitatively assess to what extent the observed change in your biological system is due to greenhouse gas-driven climate change. Um, and they wanted this in a quantitative way. So quantitatively, if you have a 100-mile northward rain shift, 100-kilometer northward rain shift of a particular species, how much of that rain shift is due to greenhouse gas-driven climate change versus natural climate variability versus all the other things that might be driving uh, that rain shift like land use change? Now, the biologist in this meeting, including myself, rejected this uh, pretty much outright. We were way outnumbered, so this is what went into the report. Um, but I want to give you the reason why we rejected this so strongly. So here's just one example from my own study system. Here's a butterfly. It uh, moved northward and upward in the Sierra Nevada over a hundred some year time period. This range movement was driven by skewed population extinctions. So it's not individuals moving. It's a population extinction colonization dynamic. We know this butterfly is very climate sensitive. I won't go into all that research. But in particular, where we've got long-term observations of individual populations and have observed extinctions, these have always been driven by extreme climate events. But what I want to point out is uh, this butterfly lives in sort of 12 to 15 different ecotypes, combinations of habitat, elevation, uh, plant type, vegetation type. And each ecotype that we know of has had a completely different climate event drive the extinction. So at lowest elevation, heat waves and drought take the butterfly and its host plant out of sync so much that the butterfly population goes extinct. Go up a little bit in elevation, there was a severe drought where the host plant, being an annual, simply didn't germinate. So the butterfly larvae came out, needed to feed, didn't have anything, they starved, the populations went extinct. Go up in uh, higher elevations, it's driven by snowpack. Lighter snowpacks below 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters, have led to, again, uh, the butterflies coming out, being out of sync with the weather, coming out too early and being zapped by a perfectly normal freeze. Now, these are the three ecotypes we know very well because we've studied them for some 30 years. There are another 12 ecotypes that we don't know very well, and it's likely there are 12 more different climate drivers that have actually driven those extinction events. Further, we all know that climate change isn't the only thing happening. A lot of other human activities affect natural populations. And the difficult thing about this is that even if we were to be able to quantify the impact of each one of these on a population or a species, these are not additive drivers. They actually have true interaction effects, which means one driver can enhance or reduce the effect of another driver, which means you <coughs> might quantitatively assess the individual impact of each of these, but you can't just add up those and get the overall impact on, on that population or species, because they're interactions, not additive. So if we, and further, if we look at what the climate modelers have done to get their attribution, what we see is they come, have come up with a very strong statement in the latest report. It is extremely likely, more than 90% certain, <coughs> that human influence has been the dominant force driving the warming of the uh, sort of past 30 to 50 years. 
But where that confidence comes from, uh, and in this graph, confidence goes from low to very high on the y-axis, and from local scales all the way up to global scales on the x-axis. Where that confidence comes from is work done at the global scale. So at the global scale, they, they attribute global warming to greenhouse gases. But most biological studies are at the local scale. So we can be very, as biologists, we can be very good if we have long time series shown in the green at linking local changes to local climate change. But we can't then bring that to a global scale to link it to anthropogenic climate change. But the, what I pointed out uh, as a counter argument in trying to come up with a bullet for the biological impacts for the summary for policymakers is we have very strong patterns, uh, almost 4,000 species, about half of them shifting northward and upward, two thirds of them advancing spring, and in every taxa and every ocean and continent. And these patterns are so strong, the only thing that could be driving it is, is anthropogenic climate change. An economist I was arguing with, this was really a disagreement between economist and biologist in IPCC, said, aha, in economics we call this a globally coherent pattern. So we wrote a paper based on using the economic argument of global coherence to argue that indeed uh, biological systems were being impacted by anthropogenic climate change with very high confidence. And in particular, what I want to note is this led to the most highly cited paper in the field of climate change. So very frustrating, but big rewards. And in that paper, we argued that we can, uh, if we can make this link at the large scale. Not everyone bought it, especially in IPCC, so I kept writing papers and papers and papers. Finally, in the 2014 report, we finally got our point through, and the biological attribution was now uh, limited to attribution to climate change, regardless of cause, so we were no longer being asked to do this quantitative assessment to anthropogenic climate change. So what I want to end with is that interdisciplinary work can be extremely frustrating. It can take a very long time, but at the end of it, it can be extremely rewarding as well. But I think the best, because it starts with huge arguments, the best place to do this is in the pub. And uh, once you get to know people and trust people and they become your friends, then you can have a much better argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. No question? Yes. And so on how did you, the global pattern, you found very convincing. What's your argument? The, the global coherence. So we actually use the economic argument in our paper to say if you go to any individual population at a local site, you can make a very, and if you have, say, 50, 100 years data, you can very firmly link that to climate change if it's responding to climate change. You can't do it quantitatively because you always have other things going on, but you can qualitatively say, you know, this extinction event was linked to climate change. The way to link that to anthropogenic climate change is you add all of those up, or you, you look at them en masse, rather than looking them at each individual study. And that was the importance of getting the meta-analyses done. So there are six global meta-analyses I've been a lead on two, involved in a third, and those were what really convinced the policymakers, the climate modelers, the economists, that we actually could say yes with high confidence wild systems, wild species are being impacted by anthropogenic climate change. But it took 10 years of arguing. 10 years after the biologists thought that statement could be made, it finally was made in an IPCC report. Yes, thanks. <laughs> West coast of Canada, near Vancouver. This is a, a picture of Simon Fraser University um, in summer. In winter, it's kind of like this, only grayer and wetter. Um, anyway, so but it is rather beautiful in the summer. I, it's about 35,000 students, 30,000 undergrads, and it's a comprehensive university. So it also has a, a graduate program. Um, and the School of Resource and Environmental Management, where I'm teaching, is one of those pr programs. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because it is an interdisciplinary program in which we do research with graduate students that's applied in order to get them to become better environmental managers. So a lot of the students that I have go off to work in um, government agencies 
Um, some of them do things like write um, climate adaptation reports or, or policies for local municipalities. So um, I'm going to be talking about my passion for research, which is glacial interglacial climate and the carbon cycle. But I'd like to point out that um, in this role within the school, I get involved working with a lot of agencies and I have a lot of students who work on a wide range of project, projects. Um, and one of the areas is looking at blue carbon in tidal wetlands and um, human fire climate interactions over the Holocene time period with colleagues at Parks Canada. Um, I'm leading a project with the um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, working with the aquaculture industry to understand the impact of ocean acidification on ca Canadian coastal communities. Um, a lot of my students are involved working with um, Metro Vancouver and BC Hydro. These are the um, water resource management in the municipality and the um, regional energy corporation, Crown Corporation, to understand interannual variability in wind speed behavior and um, precipitation events like uh, atmospheric rivers that impact the west coast of Canada. And um, recently, I've been involved in an international project to try and combine instrumental climate records uh, with um, traditional ecological knowledge that's been collected from globally from subsistence communities so that we can try and use those data together to see how we can um, better use precipitation data to understand some of the climate changes that um, subsistence communities are already seeing. So if you would like to talk to me about any of these other projects, in the remainder of the meeting at the coffee break or lunch. Um, I look forward to talking to you. But now I'm going to go back to the glacial interglacial cycle. Um, Malin introduced this yesterday quite nicely, um, in which she talked about how we still don't quite know how to explain how carbon was taken up by the ocean as we enter a glacial cycle. At least we are unable to model it. And so um, she, she talked quite a lot about the, the biological processes in the ocean. And what Zana and I have done is to focus on the physical processes that are affecting, affecting ocean carbon uptake. So here's a record going, this is the Epicodome ice core CO2 record going from 150,000 years ago to today. And um, I'm going to be focusing on different time periods, this for early drop in CO2, the mid-glacial drop in CO2. So this one was um, marine isotope stage 5D, the mid um, glacial drop is MIS, marine isotope stage 4, between 70 and 60,000 years ago, and then of course the full glacial maximum. So our approach in doing this was to um, put together a global compilation of sea surface temperature records for marine ice cores. Um, we looked at 136 sites, we um, corrected their age models so that we could put them on um, the, as close to make, make the scales as similar as possible. And then we compared them with <coughs> reconstructions from multiple proxies of sea ice and ocean circulation to try and tease out as best we could when different processes were occurring. Um, I'd like to show you briefly what these data looked like. So here we're going from 127,000 years ago back to today. On this side, these are the um, absolute changes in temperature where the bl solid black line is the, is the um, global average. Uh, it's um, aerially weighted. And then each of these colored lines represent a zonal band between 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south. The dark reds are the highest latitude, 50 to 60 degrees north. And the dark blue is the southern latitude, 50 degrees south. So these are the absolute values. We've also looked at the differences um, taken from the last interglacial period. So there's an awful lot I could say about this record um, over, over the next hour, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'd like to just point out this very, very early drop that occurs in, in both polar regions. And of course, in the North Atlantic, excuse me, the Northern Hemisphere, we see a, a very large change happening. But the timing of both of these seem to be roughly very early, both for the high latitude south and the high latitude north. So we decided to look at this mo more um, because of, it's difficult to look at leads and lags with age models, as, as I see, I see what, sorry, um, went over in the last talk of very, in great detail about the timing, two minutes. Um, so what I'd like to point out is that what we've done here is made 10,000 year averages 
so that we're really looking at the broad brush changes of what's early and what's middle and what's late. And so these are the temperature data. These are the temperature in Epica Dome ice core and the proxy of sea ice changes. So we see early changes in the ocean, but we see even more extreme early changes in the sea ice happening and in the temperature in Antarctica. So this early CO2 change co coincides with early Antarctic temperature change and a sea ice response. So that's one message that I want you to take. The early signal seems to be linked to sea ice expansion. And that's important for CO2 uptake. What about ocean circulation, which is another um, way in which one can um, increase uptake? The bottom line is, is that we don't really see changes in the C13 records that show us changes in, in the ocean circulation until about 30,000 years afterward. So in the mid, what I have plotted here are little postage stamp pictures showing the C13 of benthic foraminifera in the Atlantic Basin. And this is the last interglacial. This is the full glacial. We don't really see this a similar architecture developing until stage four. So in other words, we see an early response in the sea ice. And that is one mechanism which seems to be controlling CO2 uptake. We don't see the deep ocean circulation change until much later. So um, I think I'm out of time. So I will just put this pretty picture up and I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much. Of course, we have time for a question. A comment? Yes. So, how does more sea ice actually So, how does it work when you have more sea ice that you get more CO2 uptake? Okay, so uh, what we suspect is happening is that we're seeing um, the, the earliest effect is probably a, a, sim a simple capping effect. Is that um, it's in the southern hemisphere, largely, what we're seeing is that um, we're no longer having that contact between the deep ocean and the atmosphere. And so that is preventing CO2 escape, and it's allowing more CO2 to be sequestered. So, Sorry. I really have to say sorry. But we need to take your position in the break. Because we have, last but not least, Andrea Rinaldo giving you a final talk on the ESA session. And I can read the title of your talk. Don't. No, it says, no. I changed my mind. <laughs> kind of. At least I, I read the missions and, and the mandate of the air so. All right. Do you have the little? Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna open it. So it's um, uh, probably the the, uh, the the subject of my talk and, and the relevance. So as to say, what I do to the activities of a Berlin center deals with the hydrosphere and, uh, and climate, in a sense. Uh, what I do is uh, I run the laboratory of eco-hydrology. It's hard for me to see that when we started out, there wasn't even the term. Now it's becoming into a field. It's a field of water controls on biota, be them species, populations, or maybe pathogens or waterborne disease. And uh, I see that chairs and labs are multiplicating, even in Europe, at this point, uh, what I we specialize in, in um, is in looking at the particular substrate for ecological interactions, which water controls, in fact. And it is the one uh, depicted by river networks seen as ecological corridors. And even the landscape shaped uh, by the relatively, by the carving of uh, fluvial erosion and balancing the uplift, etc., is something in which um, we see the signatures of how nature works, in fact. Uh, mountains, as famously said by Mandel, there are no cones. Uh, 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 clouds are not spheres, no coastline are simple broken lines. What happens is that uh, if, even in ecological terms, we looked at, for instance, the fact like the local uh, peaks of species, uh, uh, local species richness with elevation, peaking at mid elevation, in fact, um, and, and it, we thought it was inconceivable even in the early studies, ecologists uh, tend to study linear slopes, are there no linear slopes out there, whether whatever the main land and landscape forming discharge you have. So a field in which I see a very uh, a potential, even for the Berlin Center activities, will be in the convergence of a number of studies based on uh, habitat suitability or distribution models, something which you take a patch, which you have uh, field work that uh, studies the probability of occupancy by a species, um, and a number of covariates, of uncorrelated covariates that explain why the species stays there, with the power of a Hanskian's concept of meter population capacity, which 
I think it's an extremely powerful and extremely, it, it's a wonderful thing. It's a tribute to Ilka Hansky, who passed away recently, by the way, whom I had the fortune, good fortune to meet. So there is a way, what we do will be uh, having a deep knowledge on how the substrate for ecological interactions, that is the, or in the landscape, if you want, we can see the adaptation to a changing climate, to complex terrains. Uh, terrains in which elevation per se doesn't mean anything. If the same elevation, we have peaks of elevation or trials of elevation with completely different connectivity. So we can study, in fact, uh, the viability of species be balancing colonization and extinction forces. So let me give you a brief example. Take a landscape of this kind, fluvial in the sense, this could be a DTM or whatever. And assume you take a fitness function peaking at a certain elevation. Uh, uh, of course, fitness and suitability are not the same thing. I will not paste you on that. There's a the realized niche of the potential need for a deep ecological concept. But the, the idea is that that's fairly clear, I think. You have a species that is best fit for a certain elevation. So what happens is that you encroach, essentially, the fitness field from the minimum to the maximum elevation to a fitness function, however shaped, it's the niche width, in a sense. What you get is that what you find figures of this type, the different elevations. Just by looking, this is physical. This is the relative amount of elevation, which is uh, one at the base elevation for the species, how the species sees it in terms of its fitness. So you have different, completely different connectivity meaning the number of sites from which you can unleash colonization forces as, a, uh, uh, as, a, as opposed to uh, uh, extinction forces. And what you do in this, key, in this case, this is a bunch of statisticians teaming up with uh, field people at the University of Lausanne across the street. What we do, in fact, we do laboratory field and theoretical studies in my lab, essentially. But what you have here, a uh, detailed society, is the probability of occupancy. What you do is that uh, you go out in the field, you see, uh, whether or not this particular species, any number of species, we have four different species, in fact, with different features, of course, and, and physiological features, in this case, are plants in the Valais in the region of Switzerland. And what happens is you take the Hanskin, you stretch the Hanskin concept, uh, and you essentially study a landscape matrix in which you replace uh, the size of the original hanskin uh approach, you put the thickness in it, and it's rigorous, it makes uh, good sense, I think, you can project, actually, the uh, metropolitan capacity onto a, an eigenvector space and finding out maps that are related theoretically and even practically to uh, the uh, uh, essential to the probability of occupancy. What is the advantage? The advantage is that, in reality, what you can do, you can essentially extrapolate make it an access model, making it um, transform a metropolitan model into something in which you can actually have the impact or climate change, because what you do, you keep a lapse rate, you essentially put up and down the landscape, changing the temperature. And you see things like even transients, which you don't have in the traditional um, uh, uh, fitness or um, uh, suitability model, and you have uh, extinction depths and all things on the likes, in different complex terrains, very respect what we know about nature. And the second area, which I think uh, there could be great, great reward for the hydrosphere and um, and um, uh, climate will be in the field of uh, the expansion of a propagation of waterborne disease. In this case, one of the things which I care particularly for is a proliferative kidney disease in salmonid fish. Why? Because in the Alps, you're going to see we have two degrees of changing air temperature, translating more or less directly into water temperature. You're going to have the extinction in the Alps of iconic salmonid species, like the brown trout, for instance. Why? Because the PKD is a it's perfect. I had two slides more. <laughs> it's um, PKD is um, uh, essentially the causative agent is a mixozoan called tetracapsuloidus salmonid, pre-biosalmonids, whatever, um, which in fact um, a freshwater bryozoan, which is the primary host, which once overly infected, it spits those spores, and then that uh, it can infect fish moving around through the gills and through the skin, concentrating in the kidney and generating a deadly, almost deadly, uh, granulosis, whatever, uh, fibrosis. What happens is that mortality is about 95% in, in farmed fish. In the wild fish population, it's about uh, more uh, uncertain, but certainly it's a deadly thing. It, for instance, in the uh, outbreak uh, of the, uh, whatever, so uh, salmonic fish in, in, uh, forced uh, uh, managers to shut down a 100-mile stretch of the Yellowstone River uh, last year as an obvious consequence of the global warming. What you have, you go out in the field and you have 
placing it to do with eDNA sampling, I'll be briefing on that, detect temperature gauges, you get DTMs, and um, um, you can study the distribution of a, uh, spores, and it, it essentially interpreting the eDNA, in this case, is a place in which, it's a big thing in many biology departments, actually, you get genetic material, you do the uh, uh, metagenomics, and you find out the relative concentration of something which tells you whether or not you have upstream certain part of that thing. Etc. Now, hydrologists can tell you lots of things, so where it comes from. That's what we do, and that's the last slide, Lina. Um, we can actually, uh, finding out that this coupled to the fact that uh, um, you have to have some spatially explicit ecologic model of how fish move around the network, but that's what we do for a living, essentially, you can do it with humans. Uh, what you have is that you're going to have it uh, in the urine, you can uh, spread some spores, and you can infect bryozoans wherever they are. Well, actually, you can have an inverse problem of a type of hydrology has been tackled for a long, long time, in which you can actually go and calibrate the model and tell you where bryozoans are in the first place, and calibrating by relative uh, uh, prevalence of a disease. And this is an area in which I think we'll see a lot of hydrosphere and uh, climate research in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a question or a comment to Andrea? Yes, please. Yes, I did. Yes, I was wondering in general about the first topic of the connectivity of the landscape there for these different species. How, how related is that to the hydrological variations? Do you study those associations at all? Well, in that case, um, uh, the, it's the hydrology that uh, gave you the uh, topology for the ecological interactions. That's how you shape the landscape, essentially. So, in fact, that's where we come from. From the hydrological study, to get how river networks carve the landscapes and how you have certain, certain self-affinity properties of the landscape. That, that in turn, gives you drainage directions. Drainage directions means directional dispersal. And we knew from Hubble's theory that directional dispersal has an impact biodiversity. Now, in that case, what we did in the lab, in fact, we did even some experiments with protists to show that this is actually the case. So we knew by just by, by just, if I look at the landscape, I can tell you something about the biodiversity. In fact, there are a nice field uh, uh, Bill Fagan, for instance, showed that the source areas are hotspots of biodiversity, and that's a good reason for that. So long story short, hydrology provides the, the, the substrate for interactions in that case, and even in the other, in the case of the spread of water disease. Thank you very much.